Hello everyone and welcome back to the Stony Bike Podcast for part two of the Alan Woods episode. If you haven't listened to part one, please go and do that. Alan had lots of interesting stuff to say. And for part two, we've been given a load of liquid death to keep us hydrated because we could be here for a while. So thanks very much for listening and I hope you enjoy. Cheers. Well, obviously, um, growing up and, you know, I started racing at Three Sisters in beginning of 83, uh, end of 82, beginning of 83. And I, I, had, I had my Robinson that we bought from you. Um, you had uh, some incredible riders um, on the on your Robinson factory team and the Rob you used to have a Robinson support team as well, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and then obviously on the 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 Torfer team. So some of the riders I can remember um, is you know the ones that you've you've mentioned early on. You know yourself, Craig Burrows. Um, I rem- I remember um, guys a year older than me. There was Matt Doran. Um, was was he was on Robinson and then did he go on to Talker as well? Well, mm, you know we made a frame for Matt. Did you? What with which brand? Well, it's the only ever Mirage frame that we did. I forgot the number plate that Nigel's got in the background there. We did number plates and we did a few brake guard and a few other pieces, but we were going to make frames, so. Birmingham Wheels, yeah. Chris from Birmingham, who lent me the fiver to get home. Yeah. In the Austin Maxi. Chris made us a prototype frame. In Birmingham. Yeah. And so did he make the Birmingham Wheels race frames as well? Yeah. Okay. Or, or he subcontracted them out. I'm not sure if they actually built them on site. Yeah. But they were uh, Reynolds tubing and brazed rather than TIG welded. Okay. Yeah. So we made one, um, we made one frame, and it was for Matt Doran. Wow! Uh, and yeah, I guess Matt raced it in eighty four. So we gave Chris all I the John. Yeah, no, uh, it's little, little known. So I think Matt was on maybe talker support, and then we put him on this Mirage frame, which we got back. Uh, and it had a European bottom. It was like an expert, what you call today. So a European bottom bracket. And it had, um, it had a road headset fitment because we could buy, use a um, Shimano Dura-Ace. They still make them, I think. Shimano Dura-Ace threaded with, with the cup size. It's different to BMX size, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Smaller yeah. diameter. Uh, and, the, yeah, that was Matt's frame. And, in fact, the guy, we sold the frame. I sold the frame like 10 years ago or something. And the guys built it like into a Mirage bike. Uh, and if you go to YouTube and on our YouTube, Alan's BX YouTube channel, from a year ago, we did an event at uh, South Sea Skate Park yeah. with our friends from We Were Rad. Yeah. And there's bike concourse there. And the bike is in the concourse. And I actually speak to the dude who's made the bike. No way. I think. Did I? I think it's in that one. Anyway, if it's not, you can put it in the comments. Um, but yeah, so he he had like a Mirage pad set made up for it, like with the red and the green. Wow. And he's got the brake guard on there. And obviously he's got the number plate and uh, like mini Amy grips, a uni seat. And it's really trick. So yeah, M- Matt, who was from Ashton in Makerfield, he was from Ashton. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he was on Talker and then we had him ride the Mirage thing. I don't know what jersey we had. I don't think we had. I don't think we had. I don't think we had Mirage jerseys. A few years ago, when we redid some Mirage parts, I did have some jersey designs made up. Or I, I did some Mirage jersey designs, but I don't think we had them uh, back then. Yeah, so one of one. We only ever made one frame, and I don't know why we didn't make any. I've got. I've, I've not. I forgot why we didn't make any. Maybe oh, wow. they were were they too dear. We. I, I don't know. It made sense for us to do a yeah. our own frame, didn't it? Here, yeah. And Chris was really cool. I don't know. I can't tell you why we didn't make it, but we only made one, and Matt rode it, and it didn't break, and someone still has it. It's still out there. Brilliant. And well, talking talking about um, riders 
Matt not breaking that frame. Um, obviously, you, you, you had some other incredible riders on, on your teams. You know, obviously, um, back in them, them, the early days, I can remember, obviously, Tony Holland was riding for you, was, had so much style, was in, incredible on the bike. Then in, would it have been 84 when you sponsored Dylan on, the, on Robinson? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't really remember what happened with Dylan because he was on Robinson and then he was on like Amico Mongoose. Yeah. Well, I remember yeah. I remember going, to, I was friends with uh, Ian Finch who rode Robinson as well, who, who lived just across the road from the uh, Three Sisters. He was, remember the name, yeah. He was a year older than me, but he, he always rode Robinson and um, I think my dad used to chat to his dad at the races and stuff. Uh, there was also a, another kid in my age group who was fast uh, called Andrew Unsworth. He, oh, he yeah. Robinson and Sean Worthington. Yeah. They both rode Robinsons. Um, but you, on your factory team, you, you had uh, Tony Holland. And then um, I remember going to Ribby Hall. There used to be races at Ribby Hall on a, on a Wednesday night. The NBMXA? Um, well, these were just like club meetings on a Wednesday night. I think uh, it was MBMXA rather than UKBMX, wasn't it? It was okay. like where you went uh, up the M6 and then turned off for the M55 and it was like the first junction, wasn't it, I think? It was at a caravan park. Yeah. And it had a, I liked it because it had a massive style. Um, so, you know, it wasn't. I was never very good if the style was flat because I didn't have much power. Um, but I, I liked it there. Anyway, I remember, I think, on a Wednesday night, they, they used to have, like, your age group, and then they'd have a, a, a um, like, a, 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 another race where you mix with a few age groups. It might have been called a trophy dash or something like that. Yeah, or, like, an open or whatever, 14 yeah. and over open or something, yeah, or under open, yeah. And they'd also have, a, at Ruby Hall, a hill climb because it was the, the big hill. Um, but I remember I was racing with Ian Finch, and and his dad brought this kid along and he had like, I can't remember what the bike was, but it was like a, a cheapo black BMX with big yellow mag wheels on. And and it was Dylan. And Darren Reedy was like the fastest in that age group who ended up riding for Torca later on. Um, I think at this point he rode a GT or something like that. And I was friends with him as well. Um, anyway, um Remember this kid like nearly beating Reedy on this like super heavy, crappy BMX, and then the next minute I think it must have been pre the first national, and then the first national that year, uh, Dylan turned up on the, on your team on a, on a, like Robinson Mini with skinny wheels and the Robinson kit, and he obviously you know, in incredible you know bike rider and uh, the style he had. And he just wiped the floor with everybody. I think he did he pretty much win every national all year on your Robinson team. Yeah, I don't remember. I mean, obviously I've, you know, remained friends with Dylan over the years and he's done amazing he's done amazing stuff. He did amazing, amazing stuff like um, you know, after the boom of BMX, um, when he you know, he was still really competitive at the highest at the very, very highest level, you know, when he was on you know, sun and, and and all that, you know. Um, but yeah, I don't really, you know, he wasn't really on there for very long. And then I think he was on like, he was yeah. on Monkey. I, yeah, I remember yeah. going to a, um, did a BBC thing. I remember taking him uh, to Oxford Road where the BBC offices used to be, uh, where the banks are outside, where we used to skate, um, you know, for uh, for that. And I think that must have been maybe... That might have been 84 or 85. So he, he was on Mongoose then. So he was only on Mongoose, like, uh, only on Robinson, I think, maybe 83. Was it 83? I couldn't remember if it was 83. Or, well, 83 or 8. Yeah, it must, it must have been, because the last year that we did Robinson before we switched to Talker, and I never really finished up telling you that story. So we all went like, yeah, we're all in on talk. We're all a Talker, yeah, Talker, Talker. Yeah, we've had enough of Robinson now after doing it all these years, and Talker's the way to go. And then, and then Graham Mary rang me up from Hot Wheels and said, "Oh, have you heard talk? I just went and bust." Oh. So, yeah. how, so how long was talk? When, when you went in all in on talker, how long did that last for? Then, well, we went. We you know, 
I don't ever think I ever spoke to Chuck. I did see Chuck subsequently and kept in touch with him into the 90s. But like, yeah, uh, we, we were just, you know, I remember building a bike up, building a talker frame up for me just to try. And Tony Holland's dad coming around to our house and like going, who's is that bike? And I was like, well, just one that we were just trying something with, you know, and we, we weren't sure what we were going to do at that point. And we must have, we must have decided we were going to do that in 80, maybe like the back end of the season of, of 84. And then Tarka went into chapter seven uh, receivership in insolvency in November 84. So we must have been like, yeah, we're all going to be Tarka. And then they went bust. And I, I remember like, I remember speaking to a guy that used to work there in production. I forget his name now because Graham said, Graham Mary told us, and Graham Mary uh, is the son of um, Russell and Neil who went on to be, um, uh, you know, Mongoose and GT and CSG in, in the UK <coughs> before <laughs> selling it to the parent company. Um, and he gave me the number of the guy. He told me the guy that had told him, <laughs> who's the guy that used to work for Talk, who used to work for Steve, and had left and got a job at CW. So I rang CW and said, can I speak to Jeff or whatever the guy's name was? And he was like, yeah, yeah, true. They just let everybody go last Friday. Uh, and I rang Roger and he, I got a job here. In, in he, he was like a welder or, you know, someone in production. Um, and then I hadn't heard from Steve. We were really close. Um, and then about a week in, Steve rang me from California and said, listen, uh, you know, I owe you an apology, but we couldn't say anything at the time because we were blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I don't think they were getting pressure from the banks. I know they were spending a lot of money on Tommy and Mike, you know, the pro salaries. Um, but things were coming round, you know, they had the freestyle frame, they had, they had a, you know, the 280 TX frame, the geometry was dated. But when the Pro X frame came out, that was, and you know, you wrote that you made that thing move in the 90s, didn't you? You know what I mean? Um, that was a really, really good frame and a, a, as good as anything that you could buy. And obviously it was good enough to be able to win a national on a decade later. Yeah. Uh, thank, yeah. That, you know, <laughs> thanks yeah. to Mr. Page there. Uh, it's a, you know, it was a, it was a great frame. So really it didn't make sense that all this had happened. And I think me and my dad just went, well, listen, and then I rang um, Bob Osborne from BNX Action Magazine and said, hey, listen, you know, you know, the talker thing, just so that you know, we're, we have plans for it here, at least in Europe. Um, and then it came out that they were having an auction and me and my dad went to California in Feb 85, um, you know, stayed in Bulletin, went to the auction, met Scott Brythe out. He actually sent me a letter, which I still have after the, after that, uh, after the auction, uh, and there's a furry story with um, Bob Madrano as well from Dino. Um, yeah, it's slightly embarrassing. I'm probably not going to tell that story. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we went to the auction and we bought all the frames, which were mostly Pro X frames and a lot of freestylish frames. A lot of freestylish frames didn't have the fork because they had a fault with the fork uh, where the steerer met the legs and they used to separate. So I think they'd sent a lot of forks out as warranty. So we had a lot of frames without forks and we earth freighted those frames and they cost a fortune and we didn't bid on the name it went a bit high we were in the bid in but it went a bit higher than what we thought i think it went for like three thousand dollars you know the, the name for talker and max which yeah you know i i know bill had been through quite a lot of wrangling uh with um with to try to get the you know the talker name back over the last eight years it's taken him and uh, I don't know how much it's cost, but it was more than three thousand dollars. Put it that way. Um, but but we registered the name uh, for the UK and for Europe, so nobody else could do it here, yeah. sell it, and um, we had the opportunity to be able to. Cause we were interested in like running talker in America. Yeah, we were never, you know, we were never that ambitious. Uh, so we could do it here. So and then we carried on, and then Tony uh, switched to Talker. Yeah, I did John Lee. So that was all through eighty five, and then in eighty six, uh, and obviously by that point, um, 
BMX was, you know, just going downhill. So uh, it went from being, it was boom and bust really for BMX. So at that point, Talker was, um, we, you know, we never really, um, you know, we sold some of the frames, but most of those frames, we only sold them in the 90s. Right, right. Literally just to the point where they were low, worth a shitload of money. Yeah. Like my dad was building up bikes uh, from like parts, just selling them to kids. You know, freestylists and pro X's just as like as an alternative to like a GT. And you know, he sprayed them up like different colors and that. Yeah. And we had different sticker kits made up and we just we were just selling them as like regular, regular bikes up until by the time it got to when we did that old school race at Warrington that you came to. Yeah. Which was I think it was two thousand or two thousand and one. So it's twenty three or twenty four years ago anyway. Which it seems like about 10, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just at that point, we'd probably sold the last one. Yeah. So I remember still selling them in the box, in the original Talker box, frame and fork, Pro X, 150 quid. Like brand new in the box. And, you know, it's hard to say whether they're worth now, maybe a grand. I don't know. Yeah. But not far off. Uh, and, um, yeah, and they were in the where my mum and dad used to live at Abram at the bungalow. Um, Rich Eames will know this. All the loft was just full of frames, and it wasn't boarded out. And we had no ladders to get up there, so you had to kind of like put your open the door, put your foot on the door handle, and then I was a bit obviously I was more agile then than I am now, and then put your foot on the on the top of the door, and then push the hatch up. And then you had to stand on the beams and the frames were just all piled up there. And yeah, like 150, 150 talker frames. So my dad would be like, we need some more frames. And I'm like, oh no. Is that where mine would have come from then? Yeah. No way. Brilliant. Well, so, um, yeah, that's how that talk. And then, you know, we know now that, you know, the... the the two brothers that owned Tioga, they they bought the name and they ended up selling it to Seattle Bike Supply, which became um eventually became like Axel with Lapierre and Rally in later years. And they also owned Redline, didn't they, as well? Okay. Um, and that's all changed again now, hasn't it? Because it's like Alter Cycling and then uh I know Bill Ryan, you know, from Supercross was in negotiations about the um Redline name and then ended up um, getting involved in the talker, and then, but then, obviously, SBS changed, got bought out by XL, and then it changed again. And you know, so I mean, even Redline and and Diamondback, two iconic names. They're sort of in the. Where are they? I know Don Phipps is doing good work with um, the Redline by Cast and stuff. I don't know if you've seen that. Like the frame has been, you know, the freestyle stuff really, which is his interest. Um, I've seen but I've seen there's a lot of like on Instagram and stuff lately. There's loads of like new red line flight cranks in like candy red and candy blue and all different colors and stuff. Well, that's a bit that's uh Planet BMX. We're getting those just from Taiwan and uh, and and uh powder coating them really nice, however. Um, but the stuff that Don was making, it was actually made by Lynn Caston, Lynn's the original owner from Red Line. Uh, but his interest really is freestyle, so those kind of I mean, you may not be familiar with them, but like those like later 80s, 88, RL 22s, you know, they were like turquoise and chrome. Yeah. Really, yeah. really nice. And they had like the top tube, the double top tube wrapped around the head tube. The I remember that, yeah. Really, really, really uh, trick. Uh, so uh, Dom Phipps, uh, who was involved in some of the freestyle books and the the Harrow one, for example, uh, he's been been involved with that, with, with Lynn. And in fact, just this week, we had some stems, the Redline Fort lift, lifter stem. And they're incredible. They're so um the 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 they're so well done. But that is separate from Redline, you know. So if you go to like Redline Bicycles, that'll take you to Alta Cycling's uh, you know, thing. And I don't even know where Diamondback is, you know. If someone made a load of Diamondback Carry Leary Turbos, I guess people would want them, right? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a little bit it's somewhat uh, it's somewhat complicated but the people that think you can just get these brands and then remake this stuff and it's easy you ask bill or you ask john de bruin who did hutch 
it's hard. Yeah. It's really, 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 really difficult. And to be able to get stuff made to that quality nowadays is um, it's definitely tough. Uh, definitely uh, a lot. It's harder now than it was then. Like we were talking about the number plates to get that stuff made now, it'd be like, and, and even things like because of um, the bringing in regulations, aren't they? And, and rightly so, uh, with regarding chroming, you're not going to, there's not going to be chrome, is there? We're not going to have chrome. Yeah. You're not going to be able to buy a Harley with chrome because, you know, it's carcinogenic for the people that are doing the treatment. Mm. Environmentally, it's, um, you know, it's really bad. Uh, and it's going to be super, super costly. And currently, I mean, I know we had a, uh, someone bring a frame in and we wanted it chrome and we were just like, dude, forget it, just get it powder coated. But it was his bike from back in the day and it was nothing special. I don't even know what, I can't remember what it was, a burner. I, I don't know what it was. Uh, and we did have it chromed for him, but it was like, it was over 500 quid. Yeah, It, it was more than what the bike was actually worth, but obviously it, it had some it emotional uh, value to, to, to the customer. So we went ahead and had it done and it was, it was really, really good in the uh, in the end so uh, you know some things we're just not going to be able to do anymore uh, another rabbit hole for you Nige. yeah <laughs> well so we were yeah. talking about riders weren't we so you were talking about we that started with with, with 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 dylan and yeah i don't know i guess it's just i suppose it's like magnetism isn't it you know we had the brands we built the track so you know people and then even people that didn't ride for us, like, you know, Brian Jones and his brother and the Greaveses maybe from Southport. So we just had this really strong Northwest scene, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you could that. race locally and then you could go to a national wherever and you were already riding at a really high level. Yeah, you were riding yeah. at a high level locally, weren't you? Yeah, that that's what I think. Um, yeah, talking about the Greaveses, John Greaves is number one in my age group in UK BMX when I started. Um, and then, obviously, there was always loads of fast kids from Three Sisters, uh, w w what we used to call it, Hinley, Hinley and District, you know, your track. Um, and then I, you know, because I lived in Rainford, it was, like, a, a bit far for me to, to go there unless my dad could take me when he wasn't at work and stuff. Um, so we had our own little crew, in in our village and and you kind of you end up riding to the level of you you know your crew sort of thing but i remember once we we went to ride it it used to be called jace's woods um was that jason R ramsden's was it uh up this way near near yeah. uh, near winstonley winstonley woods yeah you mean winstonley woods i think it was yeah and you'd have like Tony Holland and Tony Law yeah. down there and those guys, yeah. 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 And and I was friends with with Dylan and I used to race against Dylan's older brother. Oh, you mean Jason? Do you mean Jason Brown? Jason Brown. Yeah. 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 And we, I remember we went there and then we went to some other riding spots uh, where there was like a big jump that they'd made and stuff. Um, and yeah, I just remember that that everybody there was pushing each other. And they were all at a high level, so I think that that's what made you know so many good riders from 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 Wigan and stuff, um, because they're all different age groups and all pushing each other, and um, yeah, we we um, we didn't get the opportunity to go there too much other than you know when we went to the track and stuff, but I think that's what made it so cool. And then obviously you know Three Sisters track was amazing. Uh, your teams were really good and the bikes were super cool and I think just that whole scene that you created there was 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 uh, amazing nationally not just um, you know in in the northwest um, but a, a couple of years later I got friends um, it was I'm still friends now he's old he was a few years older than me but um, Tony Fleming and he rode for Talker um, and I I'm pretty sure didn't Tony made the super cross super cross super cross final at um the Sly World still riding on Talker wasn't he he was on Talker then uh yeah yeah and um I think he jumped a big set of those doubles on the corner yeah and, like smack because he was I mean he was 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, Tony's um, achievements. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know. You know, he went to America, raced as a pro, and like put it to Gary Gary Ellis and the top guys there. I mean, people forget about that because that was kind of like a little bit the dark ages of BMX. Yeah, like at the end of like when it was big here, and before it became under the UCI banner. Uh, yeah, so an, an amazing rider, super powerful, but he used to he must, smash stuff to shit. I was just gonna say he must have broke some stuff. I remember, like, I remember him being down at me dad. You know, when we were at Hindley, and he come down, and we had like we had a thing there with like some stock, and he was like, and he had another wheel, and my dad was like, "He's fucking selling this stuff. He's selling this stuff." <laughs> and I, and I, yeah, he wasn't. He was just smashing it up because. You know, he would go for it. But I remember that, that Slough World specifically. He came back and he's like, his rear wheel wouldn't spin. It was just like, if only he had Z rims, right? Like, <laughs> it wouldn't like go past, past the brake blocks. It was just, his wheel was like shaped like, you know, yeah. like this. And he went, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, seven, these are, these are 36 old single wall rims with double butted spokes. So, yeah, well, and he, and he was he, he was a big powerful guy, wasn't he? Big you know? lad, yeah. He was always big, you know, yeah. and, and strong, and he could jump, and he could do freestyle stuff, and so, so yeah, yeah he, so he, he was he was good for us, and something that is all you know over the years, um, you know, throughout the decades, and this is another point to make really, uh, and more so nowadays with social media, it, it, it it's. It's scary, really. I mean, my um, my youngest son, Ralph, he's like 26. He lives in China now. Uh, he played uh, National League basketball to a, a really high level and um, ended up going to uh, Loughborough University uh, to, to, to play there. And that's like the, the place for elite sport, basically. And a lot of the uh, national bodies that are based there kind of on the campus. And I remember talking to him about um, performance and winning. And, you know, they were worried about in the future, you know, as social media grows, um, how important is winning and how important it is to be like a Mike Miranda. Yeah, no, it's... Mike uh, Miranda, he wasn't Greg Hill. I mean, how many races did Mike even win? I mean, no disrespect, Mike. No, you no. Were Badass dude, but like, you know, even you'll say that you weren't Greg Hill or you weren't Stu Thompson. No. But you it. had something that neither of those guys had that the kids yeah. could relate to because you were a you watch him, you watch that clip from um Kellogg's at Three Sisters, and the guy's talking to Mike, and Mike's on the start gate, and he's like, Why did they call you Hollywood? And he's like, I think you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I'm a show off, and I liked, and and but people love that, and that was 1984. So if you look at that now, and I know it's difficult, it's easy to be able to say to, you know, Paddy or Ross Cullen or Kai to say, why aren't you more like Mike Miranda? Because you just when not. you're at that level, you know. I'm not that close to any of those guys, but what matters? Medals. Yeah, I mean, like British Cycling runs from like you know they get all their funding from you know they get funding all their funding, but like it's important to win medals. How can it be any other way? But surely, um, I don't I haven't got the statistics, but you you can look at riders that are like you know this from from downhill. That are that are amazing, and maybe they finish fourth. Mm. But, you know, their post from the weekend gets more likes than anybody else's. Hundred oh, percent. Um, and yeah, I mean, like go, going back, um, when when I was a kid, and the the riders that influenced me to want a different bike, they weren't necessarily just the riders that won. They were the riders that had. The best style or the best personality or look the coolest you know and and still to this day i, I you know i'm not super drawn into a, 
a bike brand just because it, it wins World Cups. It's who's riding that bike and, and, and how they come across. And, you know, I've, I've dealt with a few sponsors with the race team in, in, the, in the past, you know, five, ten years. Uh, and it's not just about the race results anymore. It's, you know, what you can offer them in with social media posts and who your riders are and what, what, what they do outside of the racing as well. Yeah. And, yeah, Mike Miranda, if Mike Miranda had been, you know, if it had been now in 80, 83, 84, Mike Miranda would have probably been one of the highest paid athletes around. You know, him and... You know, look look how good him and Andy Ruffle were on the on the Kellogg's series. Um, you know how many because we didn't have access to all that stuff. You know the amount of times I've watched the Kellogg's over the years is is insane. You know, and the certain things I can remember, like I can still do your interview on the gate at Three Sisters word by word. You know when you got interviewed by <laughs> by um, what mm. Mike Brown. I could still do that word. Yeah, back. bloody um, Pete Middleton passed me on that second straight. But I was only running a 43. Six... Anyway, did I get third? I don't know. You got but, third, uh, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, your speech on the gate before uh, you set off, I could still re re recall every single word. It's but no, a... that they, they were... Um, that's, that is interesting, isn't it, with the... And it's the same thing even... It's the same thing even now, isn't it, um, with the riders, you know, and, uh, you know, our race team. And we've stepped that up this year. And, you know, John Bentley's done an amazing, you know, he's an amazing rider. And what John's yeah. managed to achieve um, is quite, uh, quite incredible, uh, despite all the kind of injuries and setbacks that he that he had when he got back into racing. Yeah. But again, you know, John's really got a good eye for, you know, this kid's going to be good. They're amazing on the bike and, and. Yeah, it's well. It isn't about the results, really. To be honest with you, good if somebody wins. Yeah, we we had some really great results from Cycle Park at the weekend, especially on the Sunday, and I'm really proud of all those kids. And I'm not saying you know winning doesn't matter. I mean, it it it, it, it you know it does, and it makes you it makes you proud. But um, the whole, as you say, and especially with with. Less so with BMX racing, but with the mountain biking, I mean, things really changed, you know, a few years ago when people were creating their own content and then you had these, like, like crews, like, is it like 50 to 1 and those guys? Yeah, they do an amazing job. And and they really make you want to... Go I suppose, riding. Make you want to go riding, yeah. No, that, that, that's, that's the key to it, isn't it? Because even with... Um, with 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 freestyle BMX, I watched the um, I watched the World Championships up in Glasgow uh, when it was last year. Uh, I was in hospital still at the time, but I watched all that. So I watched, you know, I watched the racing, I watched the flatland, I watched the uh, the park, men's and women's uh, disciplines, and you know, park. It just left me cold. You know, you've got these amazing riders that can do all this stuff. Like your Kieran Riley, I mean, the kid is just amazing, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, that gold medal's got his name on it before he goes to Paris. Do you know what I mean? I mean, incredible. However, and obviously, I'm not the demographic get demographic for these brands being 59, but it doesn't make me want to ride. You know, it's too. It there's like it, it's elevated to the point where there's kind of there's too much going on. Yeah. Uh, Whereas, you know, there are still riders that like Kevin Peraza really he isn't doing all the mad stuff, but it, it, it's done with a lot of style. Not that Kieran hasn't got style, he has. I don't want to confuse people here. Um, but like I, I know also Peraza, like he's fucking stoked, man. Yeah. You can see that he still loves it. Yeah. And again, I'm not wanting to put these different styles of riding against one another because this happened with skateboarding in, in like the 80s where you had like Tony Hawk and Christian Hossoy. So you had this like Tony Hawk who could do all these technical tricks, 900 and everything else. And you had Christian Hossoy that was like this looser kind of hash kind of dude who'd do like the rocketers and it was all super cool. 
and you were in one camp or you were in the other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not to take anything away from Tony Hawk, because who can? Tony Hawk changed the face of skateboarding. Yeah. More than any other human being, you yeah. know, through the video games and everything else that he's done and just, and still an amazing, humble, down to earth, you know, guy. And you don't see that much of Christian Ossai nowadays. I don't know. But yeah. it, it, it's, um, it's interesting, isn't it? And and you, you can't sort and nobody with either of those guys or, or or Mike Miranda or whoever it was, they didn't have a media coach. No. No one told them how to speak in front of the camera. It was just it was just them. So to yeah. and I know we're using, you know, Mike Miranda as a but you know, but there were other riders, weren't there? You know, you know, Billy Griggs and some of the other riders, Steve Veltman probably nearer to your age group yeah. like he was just like spider-man on a bike wasn't he yeah. you know i remember seeing those pictures of those guys the hutch team at slag iron worlds in 83 i say seeing pictures i was there wasn't it what was i talking about yeah, yeah. just to see them like you know doing turndowns over the jumps like in between the races yeah. you know obviously again you know we haven't really given the respect to hutch um it's a little bit bittersweet for me because I don't know if you know this, but Rich Hutchins was a Robinson distributor on the East Coast. So when he wanted to do his own thing, he basically just took a hutch frame, took the gusset out, and that was a hutch. Wow. No, I didn't know. Um, and obviously, they had a semi-leading axle fork instead of an inline fork that the Robinson had. But if you look at a hutch frame and a Robinson frame... It was very similar. It's the same frame. Yeah. Just He just had them made. I think Profile made them. And he just sent them a frame and they had it made. Um, but I was there in 83 uh, and Hutch had a cruiser and he was selling really well. And like Chuck's like, yeah, I'm going to make a cruiser. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, I'd like to get a cruiser. That'd be cool. Uh, and we went out to a shop in Simi Valley and bought a Hutch cruiser. No way. And we went and took it directly to Boris Dixon and said to Boris, make this. Wow. Chuck got his own back in the end. No way. Brilliant. <laughs> and well, that, 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 you know, the, the Robinson Cruiser is a hutch. So it was uh, obviously it. with the inline, with the, with the inline, with the inline fork. But again, you know, the jersey with the stars on the sleeves. Well, again, it, it, it looked incredible. Like, you know, for me in the, when I first started, the Robinson kit was by far the best. I, I thought, you know, way better than anyone else. One else's that was my favorite, and then when Hutch came out, I, a few you know, was at eighty five. I you know my, my dad got me a Hutch, um, because that looked incredible to me as well, um, but both both of those two uh, outfits and and bikes did, were were two of the coolest I, I thought growing up, for sure. Well, I listened to that interview with you, and you're like. Yeah, went to Doncaster BMX. It was like driving across Europe. I'm like, why didn't that Nige speak to me? I could have got you a hutch. You see, you were from China. I could have just got you one. Well, I'm like, you see, I, I didn't know all this. Like when, you know, obviously we weren't was... doing a good enough job. Obviously, we were so focused on Robinson. People were like, you want a Robinson? You go to Allen's and blah 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 blah. But, you know, but we sold PK Rippers and Patsons and. Honestly, I on, on all my other stuff, but I was literally like, and you're like, yeah, we were off to Doncaster. It was taking ages. I'm like, Nige. <laughs> yeah, we did. We didn't honestly didn't know. Like, you know, I I raced um all all over the UK as as a kid and stuff, but I I never was bothered about hanging out with all the pool fastest people. I just hung out with m my mates, you know, the ones I liked hanging out with. We used to come and and stay at my house and I'd go to their house and all that and you know my dad wasn't part of the industry or anything like that so I think people used to just say you know I, I said to me dad oh I'd love to have a hutch and somebody must have told my dad oh you get a hutch from here it didn't even cross it yeah it might have been I think they had like a half page black and white ad in like BMX bi-weekly it was probably that I, I think, and it, and it was like Hutch, and that was kind of the, oh, well, they were just a dealer rather than like an importer. So you were yeah. just like, oh, Hutch. And of course, we wouldn't run an advert that said, Hutch. Hutch, would we? 
No. I, I didn't even think you'd be able to buy it. Like, looking back now, I didn't think you could get a Hutch or a, a different brand from you because I just thought of you as being yeah. Robinson or Talker. But, you know, I wasn't part of the industry then, so now I... Yeah, no, no. Well, if I can, you know, I'll get in my time machine tonight and go back to 1981 and <laughs> reappraise my marketing approach. Yeah, we were, we could have just come to your shop instead. I know, I know, but yeah, I mean, we didn't sell that many of them, but you know, we did, uh, we did. But the the thing was as well, there was a um, there was a Dutch guy bringing them in uh, through the kind of back door, and he was selling them to Dennis Christian, uh, who had a shop in um, Barton near Barton Aerodrome track in Manchester uh, called Viking BMX. Right. I didn't really know the guy. I was an older guy. Well, he, you know, I was 16, so he was like a bloke with like a tash. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he did a few things like that from this guy from like Holland. Uh, okay. And I think this guy, sorry, I can't, if anybody's, and I can't remember his name, uh, he used to, you know, buy them from the US. And, and I think he had like relatives over here or a girlfriend or something over here. So he would come over here like once a month or something and he would bring, you know, a few frames and he would um, take him to Dennis Christian. And I was just reading through some old magazines recently and and it's and it was BMX News and it said like, oh, who is the real distributor for this? Mm-hmm. And they must have said that, you know, Freewheeler Leisure, Gecko, who did like Redline and Kuara were the distributor for this and this brand. And then Dennis Christie must say, well, I'm doing it and I'm paying for an advert. So they'd run an article saying like, you know, you can get these this brand. I can't remember what he was now. It might have been Hutch, I don't know, uh, from this place, Dennis Christian, Viking BMX, all through whatever. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, at the Times, any of this, uh, any of this, what we're talking about, nobody had any contracts. No, no. You, you weren't like the official, you know, you signed for like two years to be. Yeah, the official distributor for. No, 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 nobody had any, nobody had any contracts. And I don't even think, did the riders have? I think maybe the riders maybe had a page, like I'll do the nationals and I'll do my best to promote the brand type of you know, a single page thing. Um, but yeah, everything was done on a handshake. I mean, going back to um, Roland Swimbank, who did Fox from 1976 going into 1977, up until Bert Harkins had it. So in into the 80s, um, uh, uh, and when Roland uh, passed away, uh, you know, his son was running it, and and um, th- that was it. That was like the end of the agreement then. Yeah. So it was like till till death, basically. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, th- these uh, these things. Uh, there wasn't any. Um, you know, the, the, you know, we didn't have any. We didn't have any contracts with anybody, which, you know, it's fortunate that we, you know, we kept the. But I suppose not having a contract is a good thing because it means both parties have still got to like make it work and, and obviously yeah. you've got a little bit of experience of this as well yeah who wants to be tied into something that you don't want to be yeah for sure yeah definitely you know what i mean yeah. uh, so I, you know that's why i'm trying to like put this in today's perspective and i know you don't want to you know i understand why these things have got to be there because you might have a sponsor or some or a partner that spends a load of money on you or on content or whatever and then you just jump ship to another thing and they're left yeah. without it being a good deal. Um, and I don't know whether people's people's word isn't worth what it was. I, I, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I guess, you know, it's, it's like a, any era, any industry, you've got really honest people and you've got other people that are just in there to make money and sometimes you know that's i guess that's why these contracts are there and and yeah you know but so um obviously you 
it, it's amazing what you've done with your shop and you're still you know alan's bmx today from you know from running it as a as a kid with your mum and dad what obviously there's been some uh challenging times with bmx you know as you said it started dying off in the in the um sort of late 80s and then <clears throat> I, I was out of bmx for about eight years um all together when i turned 17 and went to work and driving cars and going to raves and stuff and 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 you were still still there and you you, you ended up you know selling up a lot of skateboards and records for a, a, a period of time was, was did you always bring in and sell bmx's was there any period where they just weren't selling at all uh, what... no sold a bit sold a bmx bike every year at least since 1981 i mean we moved in 1987 into wigan yeah uh, center we used to be in hindley yeah and we were there for a year which is because we only had a one-year contract because they were knocking the shops down to build the galleries, which they've just knocked down again. Yeah. So uh, that's a long story. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, we probably didn't sell that, you know, that many bikes at that time. And then we moved to, uh, within a year, then in 88, we moved to Hallgate. And then skateboarding was really big. And we'd done skateboards from... In fact, I was looking for a picture to send you. I'll I'll, I'll try and dig it out. Um, there's a photograph of me, and it must be 1985 or 86. And I'm in the shop that you'll know from then in Hindley. Yeah. And I'm stood, like, with all the bikes around me, talkers mostly, and a, a Robinson. And on the wall, we've got all these Alva skateboard decks. Uh, in fact, it was 85, because when we went... Me and my dad went to uh, uh, the Talker auction in February 85. We went to Tony Alva's, like, shed. And he'd made a load of custom boards, all, like, custom painted. I mean, I, I can't imagine what they'd be worth today. Um, and the, the whole wall is just full of all these Alva decks. I, I've got to find the picture now, haven't I? Um I've lost my train of thought now. Well, what was the question? So I was saying, you know, over all those years, did, were you always selling? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, no, bikes? for sure. So that that was skateboarding, and then skateboarding then became skateboarding went through a similar underground period in the early eighties, like BMX did in the late eighties. Um, but we were skateboarding a lot at that time, um, and then when we moved to and then there's this connection between music and skateboarding. Well, punk and skateboarding, really. Yeah. Uh, before, you know, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater with, like, the soundtrack, which made all these bands brought, you know, a whole new audience to the Dead Kennedys and people like that. But there was a close thing between, um, you know, uh, American hardcore punk and just punk in general uh, between that and skateboarding. Uh, and, and I'd always, um, you know, like music and love, you know, the Sex Pistols and the Damned and then, you know, Crass after that. So there was always that connection. So through having still selling BMX and doing the skateboards, we started selling records. Yeah. So that was a, people are like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But, you know, I always loved music and, you know, loved, you know, Slade and then David Bowie and whatever. So it was always a really important part of my life and still is. And so then when we moved to um, moved to Wigan, we were able to kind of like do a record shop, albeit on our terms. So people would come in for like Duran Duran and stuff like that. <laughs> and we didn't even have, re we didn't have an account with like any of the major labels. So we didn't have any chart music at all. So we would just have like the most mainstream thing we would have is like the Smiths. Yeah. People would go, have you got like number three? I'd be like, what? Because <laughs> <laughs> they just see records in the window and think yeah. it's a record shop. They'll just sell records. Yeah. And we just saw, so I remember doing the order with like Rough Trade. So we had like all, all you know, all the crass label stuff 
and you know all you know conflict and all the new kind of like punk stuff and it was when the whole thing was going on with like you know uk hardcore and the electra and extreme noise terror and napalm death and all that so we'd have like you know all the rough trade label stuff and 4ad like cocktail twins and that was as and we didn't sell any like mainstream music at all and it was successful and then we moved to hallgate uh, and then you know expanded a bit more and then we were fortunate fortunate uh, um you know uh Stuart McConey who's now a renowned uh you know writer and broadcaster you know has been you know kind enough to be able to mention us in in his he's wrote well, quite a few books mentioned us in the books and always does mention us whenever he gets a chance so shout out to Stuart uh and uh, Richard Ashcroft from the Verve yeah um uh, uh, uh cited us on a few occasions as being an influence because he would come into the shop and he would buy I don't know the railway children or you know whatever thing that we had on factory records or whatever, but we also BMX at the time. Yeah. So that then at that time we had the record shop downstairs and then upstairs we had like skateboards. We had a few bikes, a few of those talkers that yeah. you were talking about, um, and then we moved from the to Main Street, which is probably where you got the Pro X from, when we had. I think we probably had BMX upstairs then and we had the record shop and the skate stuff downstairs. I'm not even yeah. sure. We kept it around a few times. I think so. Um, I, I remember coming in and, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't rode a BMX. That was in 96. Um, was it that long? Was it that late? 96? Yeah. And we were like, everyone was aluminium bikes and we were like, my dad's like, you want one of these talkers? I didn't have a clue what BMX, what BMX's people had. All I knew was, you know, uh, well, basically what happened was I I, um, I got a, I started riding, I did a couple of years of motocross and then I got, I had a mountain bike and I got a job riding at the weekend for the council doing the Duke of Edinburgh Award. But I kept breaking my mountain bike because I just had a normal Diamondback mountain bike and my dad was forever trying to fix it and stuff and I was just riding it like we rode our BMXs, you know, jumping off stuff in the street and going the golf course and jumping bunkers and stuff and and then anyway I ended up getting a a, a better bike, a, a GT Zaskar because we won some money in the office syndicate and I ended up at Coppel BMX track with my mate and um, I bumped into uh Dave Ives and Darren Reedy uh didn't even have a clue that there was people were still racing BMX bikes um and and I, I I could still ride the same as I did when I finished in 88 I I just rode down the start hill jumped all the jumps and they were like wow you can still ride your bike and I was like yeah I didn't really think you know anything of it and they said we're going to a BMX national in a few weeks why don't you come? And I was like, right, okay. Um, so then I just went to your shop and asked and said I needed a BMX frame. I can't even remember how it happened exactly because I had a few parts, you know, left in the garage and stuff. And so I bought the Toker Pro X off you. Obviously, you said you, you had Toker Pro Xs and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember them. Flemo had one of them and, you know, your team. And then I, I got the bike built up and... Remember Mike the bike from Kirby? Yeah, of course. Yeah, he, had, he used to help all the kids out, didn't he, with parts and stuff? Well, my dad used to always talk to him at the Kirby BMX track because they were like engineering and they used to talk about bearing sizes and all that stuff. I ended up, I don't know how, I don't have no idea how, but I ended up at his house and he, he was like a hoarder and he had just, I, I said, I need, a, I need some rims because the, it, you, I think your dad must have sprayed this talker white and it had the chrome red and white stickers on. And I had a few bits in the garage and uh, I had some... Was it, all, was it all white or was it like red and white? It was all white, the frame. No, that's how they came from talker. They were... Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah, it was all white. And anyway, so I wanted to have the red bits on it and stuff. I, I had some Campag hubs still in the garage, some hutch cranks and... Uh, some other bits, and then Mike got me some. Um, he had some red 
uh, aero rims, aero uh, uh, aero rims. So we built them up. I think I must have got like a, a saddle off you and some grips and bars and stuff like that. Can't can't quite remember. Anyway, built this bike up. Literally rode it. I think I went riding around the village on it once, and then went to this national, and everybody was going mental over my bike. Like I didn't realize it was. It wasn't. It was, like, it was twelve but, years old, twelve, thirteen years old by then. But I didn't know. I didn't know the bikes had changed. I didn't know they were all aluminium. And... Oh, I feel a bit. I feel a bit bad. But like. Yeah, but I won. <laughs> I know. I know. It was ace. The thing I've got. I've got. I've got mixed feelings because, like, one, I'm like, oh, we we we've, we've duffed him off a bit here by climbing one of these pro old talker frames up. But then it, the the. The, the the joke was on you because you whooped their ass. Yeah, well, I, I, do you know what, Alan? I'd never won a national ever when I raced as a kid. I got second and I got third. And uh, I was actually winning Chesterfield and Darren Cross handlebars running me back wheel down the first straight and I, I lost that. But um, So I just didn't have any expectations whatsoever. Raced in 19 and over expert. Um Borrowed my mate's hutch helmet. He had an open face hutch helmet still in the garage, and uh, ended up making the final and, and winning. It was it was insane. And so, like, were, were, were you much different in age group to Alan Hill? Same age group. Right. Okay. I thought you might be. Yeah. So I remember racing Hilly a bit when I was a kid, um, and um, and Darren Croft was really fast, um, and. Uh, you know, but going through my going through the eras of when I was racing, obviously, like when I s s first started off, jo John Greaves was super fast, and then for quite a while it was Jeremy Kennings. He was like this giant in our age group. He just won everything because he was so big and powerful. Um, and then, um, but I started getting decent at it when I was at like. 15 because I grew you know like any other kid if you grew and had a bit more power and then I stopped doing it so then when I came back to racing in 97 um I, you know I was as big as everybody else so I guess it was easier mm. do you know what I mean uh, but that would have been 19 plus that would have been like that would have been tough that wouldn't it so anyone who was 19 or over was in that class it wouldn't have been an easy age group that would it no, but I, did, I didn't know who, I didn't know half of them. I just knew like Dylan and 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 Flemo and um, Reedy and that they were in the pro class. Um, so I only really knew them. I didn't really know all the people in Night and Over Expert. But yeah, they said it was. I know Dave Ives who I went with, who had been racing. He he didn't make the final, and he's like, "No way, you've made the final." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah," and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty mad um but, but what, what's interesting what you've said and this is good advice to anybody who might even still if there is anybody even still watching or listening to this at this point i mean <laughs> get a life this is episode 25 like that th this is something that you know my dad did when i was racing motocross we didn't go to the same club every week so i never got any end of season like awards for like northwest schoolboys because we would race there one weekend and then we would race in like Yorkshire the next weekend and then we'd be in Cumbria the weekend after and then we'd be in Birmingham. So obviously, I, and eventually I got to know who I was racing against, but like a lot a lot of, you get stuck in a groove, don't you? Of like, I know yeah. I can beat him. Yeah. He can beat me. Yeah. So you, you, you're holding yourself back psychologically. Yeah. I definitely because, did that when I was younger. Because you've got this pecking order. So just to go to like another club and you don't know who you're riding against. Yeah. Uh, and it does you so good, not just for your performance there on the day, but allows you to take that. Because let's be honest, you know, cycling and BMX, it's so mental. Oh, 100%, yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously you've got to be fit. You've got to be in shape. Your legs have got to be strong. And your body's got to be strong now. But like... The mental aspect of it, yeah, is such such a large part, and I, and I think if you know if I had kids that were racing grand or well, grandkids, yeah, you know, you want them to go to like somewhere where they didn't know anybody, yeah, and, and just ride to the best of your abilities, and then you can start to get that mindset of like just narrowing in on 
just doing you, your thing. You race it in the track. You're not racing anybody else. You know. Yeah, it's the same. Same with my little boy plays. He's twelve, coming up to thirteen. He plays football, and when they know they've got a a tough match, a tough. He's they're already going. Oh, we're playing this team. Yeah. We're going to lose today. I'm like, how do you know? It's, it's the same with BMX. And I used to look at the. The moto sheets, and if I had Jeremy Kennings flipping Nicky Restall and whoever in the motos, I was like, oh, God, I'm going to get smoked. You know, whereas, like you say, if you don't know who's in your race, you, you haven't got that doubt, so you just give it your all, don't you? Yeah, yeah. No, for, um, yeah, definitely for uh, for sure. Oh, so that's funny that you were in a Hilly's age group, but, yeah, I thought you might be. Yeah, and, and obviously I've, I've only dabbled in BMX racing um since the 80s, like every, it, it seems like about every seven years I get a, this, this seven year itch. Yeah, yeah. So I did that in 97 and did a couple of races around that time because that's when I started downhill racing. Um, but some of my friends who I got friends with again were still doing BMX, so I did, did, did a bit then. I ended up in, I think, in night. So that was 96. In 97, I ended up doing a couple of nationals on, on Cruiser. And I ended up racing with Geth, who was one of my heroes as a kid. That was that was an insane um, um, experience to race against Geth, you know, years later. Yeah. Um, and then I did a whole year's racing. In... Oh, you, we didn't mention Kellogg's 85. Uh, what? Uh, oh, of course I did, yeah. It still puts <laughs> hers on the back of my neck now. Um, and then I went to... And then I did a whole year's racing in 2005, so a long time after again. Um, and that, I, I raced with Tony Fleming all year, battled with him in the National Series, the World's Europeans, I did it a year. And then I went back and raced in... So in in two thousand and five, yeah, I raced, I raced thirty to thirty nine cruiser and nineteen and over expert again on twenty inch. But Hilly was in elite. But I remember racing Hilly at the Europeans in Cheddar on cruiser because he he raced cruiser then as well, and I I actually managed to win that. So I beat Tony and um, Hilly in that race, and then I didn't. And then I stopped doing it again because I was busy with mountain bike stuff and, and then I, I went to the world championships in 2012 in Birmingham oh yeah I, I raced that uh, ended up tangling with some Dutch guy I was actually leading out the first turn got a better start than Hilly and, and then me and this Dutch guy tangled in the first turn and Anthony Revel passed us who was in my age group as a kid as well uh, and then I ended up getting third there um and then yeah i did a race a couple of years ago um at the indoor um just because i think it was i remember we we want we on the uh on the quad angle yeah. angle yeah i remember yeah, so, I, so i turned up on the quad angle um and I've, like there was a lot of serious guys in my age group i knew you know reedy and and, and reedy and uh Alan Hill were the two fastest guys in the class and, you know, they're all clipped in and stuff. And I turned up on the quad angle with my vans on and everyone was asking me, why was I riding this bike? And why was I, what was I doing? And it's like, I don't know, it's a cool bike, isn't it? <laughs> so I just raced on it and I, I managed to get, I think I got fourth or second day on it, um, which was cool. Mm, I remember that. I remember that. That was amazing. But that's, that's what's so important, isn't it? Because, if you do something, rock up with something like that, and no one expects you to do well, and if you, you you can't you can't lose, can you really? No. Because if you if you got moto, no one would think any different. And if you do well, whatever you do is a bonus, isn't it? Yeah. And to be honest, Alan, um, you know I don't when I race, I'm competitive, and I always try and win whatever I'm doing. Um, even though if I don't think I'm, I can win, I still, now as I'm older, I try and win. But, um, I, I, and this is a question I wanted to ask you because you've been much more involved in BMX over the, the decades than I have. But the, 
the the modern BMXs is as as how cool they are and how you know high tech they are and whatever. You know, I've dealt with high tech mountain bikes and stuff, but I just don't really like I just like the look of eighties BMXs. Um for me that's what a, a BMX bike is and obviously, you know, I'll, I'll I need to ask you about the talkers and stuff, but that just makes me more excited. You know, I could go out and buy a, a carbon BMX and flipping go and try and win the 50 plus and over class, but it doesn't really interest me. I'd rather go and race on a, a bike that's pro molly and looks looks like it did in the 80s, you know what I mean? But that's just me. Um. Yeah, I mean... I appreciate that you know the BMX has evolved, and I, and I, and you know once you know what goes into like you know carbon fiber and you know how stiff the bikes are and you know the hydroforming of the tubing and you know the width in the bottom bracket and how much you know surface area the tubing has got in the head tube, um, it's <clears throat> yeah it's fascinating uh, stuff. Um, on one hand, <clears throat> and on the other hand, it's kind of going back to what we were talking about with, you know, the Johnsons and the fact that they made a a mild steel version of the talker to make it affordable. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, it does worry me that the entry level price, and obviously a kid can just go and buy <clears throat> a complete GT for like 600 quid and win a national on it. Yeah. That, that can happen. Um, but it's tough to put a kid on a start line on that when everybody's got like carbon rims, right? You know, some kids don't give a shit and they'll just perform their best, <clears throat> but you can't help but, <clears throat> I mean, even yourself, you know, it's you're coming from a, at it from a different perspective now, but if like you've got good equipment and your stuff looks good and you feel good and your bike's good you know you believe so you believe that you can win because you know you've got everything that you need and you feel good it's like it's like when you get a new bike isn't it you're just so yeah. stoked yeah you build a whole new bike up from scratch and you're just like man yeah that feeling never leaves you does it no you just like you just want to ride up and down the road you don't even need yeah. to go to the track you just you just stoked aren't you yeah uh, and i think that is <clears throat> that's important, but it's a little bit, I think the whole thing where parents think, you know, you've got to go to Holland training and you've got to go, you've got to do, and maybe it takes some of the, the fun out of it. But this is all part of the elevation of the sport, isn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, and BMX yeah. has always been really cool because, you know, although it was dear back in the day, relatively, and I've always said this, BMX racing was always the sport, or even BMX freestyle, really, was sports that you could, <clears throat> it was attainable and affordable. Yeah. Like, if you want to do any other, if you go to British Cycling website and you look at the disciplines, downhill, enduro, cross-country, road, track, even trials, <clears throat> I mean, how much is a bike? Five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand? I don't know. Yeah. BMX, 500 quid, mate. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, it's good enough to be able to do the job. It's going away from that a little bit. Yeah. And this is me speaking to someone that sells, like, you know, carbon fiber frames that are two grand. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great that it's got that. It's become a little bit like Formula One. Yeah. And that's part of the sport becoming elevated to the point where people respect it finally after 40 or 50 years. <clears throat> but it makes it less accessible to, you know, and let's be honest, you know, the state that this country, don't start me going down this rabbit hole, the state that the country's in, a little bit less so the country that you live in now, Nigel. Can't blame you, mate. Who knows? You might end up in Europe again. No yeah. chance for us. We are screwed. <laughs> Edge your bets. I'm off. Yeah, I've thought about it myself. There's a nice house down the road for sale if you want to join us, Alan. 
and the, there's a few bike, there's a few shops for sale as well. Yeah, well, that's yeah, mixed blessings there with them two things. But I tell you, the um, it's hard for people, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you speak to normal people, um, and you know, we don't even know how bad it is. We because we're here and we're like in it, it's difficult, isn't it? Just normal people who are in this one percent of the world, and you know, there's you know, a husband and wife who are working 40 hours a week and still can't make it pay, yeah, because of like the cost of everything and shrinkflation yeah. and everything else. Have you seen the size of a curly whirly? Yeah. Recently. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But stuff is, I mean, I had to go for a scan at um Trafford a general hospital uh, for a CT scan. And you know, I was like, oh, we'll go to Peter Express. Went to Peter Express. We had I had a pizza. Julie had like a salad. I don't think we had a starter. We had a mineral water, and I think she had a dessert, and I had a bit of it. It was 42 quid. Oh, no. it's in, it's in, I mean, it is just... It's insane. So, so, you know, to have, you know, BMX to be a um, an affordable sport and that it's going away from that, mm. It, mm. it is a bit sad, really, that we've got that. BMX freestyle still... You don't yeah. need to have titanium spokes and yeah. you could still probably spend <clears throat> less than a thousand pound on a bike and win any contest in the world. Yeah. 48 spline crank and some sealed hubs and, you know, double wall rims and a, and a frame that suits you top tube yeah. wise. You, you could still win the Olympics on that bike. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's not, that's still kind of, um, you know, heartwarming that that's still accessible, but it is a little bit sad that BMX racing's got to be gone so far. And then that kind of leads me on to something that we've discussed, you know, many times over the last decade or so, how BMX has become so removed from bicycle yeah. motocross. Yeah. And, you know, now, Obviously, when I did that race in Warrington, which was 2022, 23 years ago, and now someone's done the Frogtown event and the um, uh, the Dirty Fest, Mike Miranda's Dirty Fest event, and you see those events and you're just like, not even from an old school perspective, but you're like, yeah, yeah, That's that is hard. rad. And 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 then the I don't know if you saw the one in France, the bicycle and motocross day that Fabien. Uh, did. I've not seen that one. It, it, that I'll send you the link to it. Yeah. It's in South um, Western France, heading down towards like Montpellier Way. Um, and again, it's very similar. Um, I'll send you the link to the video. But they're not doing it this year. There, they're going to. They've got. They can't use the field apparently, but they're going to do it next year. Um, and I'm talking to them about us being involved in that. It's an amazing event. But you see those events, and you just think. And you, I know, obviously, we've got all this controversy about, like, flips and, you know, the tarmac berms, and that's taken away some of the racing, and the racing's become more like track And since it's been in the Olympics, and I can see all that. But I can still watch it. You know, I was yeah. at the Manchester National, and it's still amazing. Yeah. And obviously, it's not what it was. Whereas, and we've discussed this, you know, m motocross, motor arts, motocross, and... In, I mean, they still race at Hawkstone Park. Yeah. I mean, it's still the same track that they rode in like 19 bloody 60 or 50 or whenever they started there. Yeah. Like when they had a, you know, Grand Prix there in the 70s and the 80s, it, it's basically the same track. Yeah. I mean, I know the bikes are like four strokes and blah, 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 and everything else. And yeah, the bikes jumps. are amazing. But the sport is still the same where BMX is like, it's it's like BMX bicycle supermoto. It isn't yeah. bicycle. Yeah. Motocross. It, it's a hybrid of, you know, tarmac and and dirt and everything being you know compressed. Yeah. Um, and I was talking to um, my mate Dave Arnold 
recently when we went to the studio to do that work on the record, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about this, and he used a really <laughs> good, a really good music analogy. It's like in the 1970s, you know, music went further and further and further with like progressive rock. So we had like Deep Purple and then we had these other like prog rock bands like Yes and Nazareth. And the songs went from being like three minutes long to like 12 minutes long, you know, and I love some of that stuff. I'm not ragging on it. And it just went so far. And then punk rock came along with a two minute song and three chords. And it was just a reset. And it yeah. almost feels like BMX racing yeah. has gone so far that it's taken this raw essence that it used to be <clears throat> away from it. So may maybe these, you know, more dirt orientated events, not just for the old school guys. I think the kid, I think if we had like a downhill dirt race, the kids would love it. Yeah, I, I mean, I I watched the footage from Dirty Fest like the other weekend, and um, you know, obviously I was it was exciting watching the old school guys racing, but I watched some of the you know the kids racing, and they were just on like old school BMXs and and modern BMXs with the seats up, and like th those bikes, you know, I still ride them now, as you know. I'd I'd, I'd go down some my unit or go to this the veg shop or, or, on my BMX with my seat up and ride around the village on it. I don't care if people look at me. It's it's a it's a much nicer bike to ride down to the shops on than my Enduro bike with big sticky tires on. And uh just think bikes for those kids you, you can just do a bit more on them. You know, if you've got a carbon clipped in race bike with a a seat that's basically attached to the frame. You can't do anything else with that other than go the BMX track. No, it's like it's like a trials bike, isn't it? Really, yeah. it's single purpose. Yeah. Whereas, like you know, I, I, I look, there's so many good mountain bike trails here where I live. It's like one of the when the weather's like nice like this now. There's not many better places in the world. Um, it's as good as anywhere. Um, but like you were saying, there's. You know, the estate I live on, not everyone can afford a five grand mountain bike. If we had a little dirt track here, like with jumps, BMX track that kid and, and the local shop sold BMXs where you could put the seat up and ride around on them, just think it'd be so accessible to, to, to put people that can't afford to get into mountain biking. And you can have just as much fun, I think. I, yeah, I just... and, then, and then people think that, Unless you could achieve that and that price point, you can't do it. So unless unless you can have, and because you know kids are kids, aren't they? So if you turn up like it's that when you got the grifter and your friends had the BMX bikes, they'd have been like, "Dude's on a grifter." Or like when you said when Dylan turned up and yeah. you know Ribby Hall and he had the the bike with the mags on, and people were like, "Yeah," you know what I mean? And and obviously yourself and. You know, Dylan was strong enough characters to say, you know what, screw you. I'll I'll bring the I'll come on this bike and I'll still whoop your ass. Yeah, yeah. But it. a lot of kids, you know, they wouldn't do that, would they? They'd be like, Oh, that's because I haven't got such yeah. a thing. Yeah, because sad. Of, and sad. also, you know, the pressure of, you know, social media and how I can't imagine what it must be like to live in a kid's world oh, in, 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 in 2020. I mean, my kids were just I mean, Toby's 31 and Ralph's 26 or 27 or something. Yeah. I don't know. He, he um, you know, they just, they just, you know, they had PlayStations and they had Nintendos and stuff, but, and then they had phones when they came out, but they really were, they missed that entire, yeah, that entire thing. So this pressure that the kids must feel that they've got to attain, I mean, not yeah. just, I mean, not just with bikes, with clothes and, 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 and trainers and, yeah. I mean, it was a bit like that when we were younger, wasn't it? If he didn't have like Vans or Adidas, yeah, or they were on. Or... But but now it's like, have you seen how much trainers even are nowadays? Well, you've got a teenage. They're not like fifty quid, are they? Do you know what I mean? No. And, and you know, but especially for bikes, so that does make me feel a little bit sad that the BMX can't be more accessible to 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 more people. 
Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I, and I still stand by, you know, when we had that deal, you know, a, a, a Christmas with, well, I'll say it, GT. Yeah. You know, we had that deal with GT and we did bikes for half price. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a kid could get like a GT 16 inch or an 18 inch performer, seal bearing bottom bracket, seal rear hub, integrated headset for 175 quid, which yeah. was less than we sold bikes for at that price, at that quality point in 1981. Hello. So, you know, we got hundreds of kids onto BMX bikes, you know, just, yeah. and, and we both know that. You know, for the average kid, a single speed bike is way better than like a geared bike. Yeah. Because how long do gears stay in? in the kid throws it down, the rear, the rear mech gets bent. They're, they're not, a, no, you know, I love mountain bikes, but they're not a good, they're not really a good thing for kids, are they? No, not definitely not, not to learn. And like, you know, my, my little lad, he doesn't, we, we've got a pretty basic pump track about, four miles away that we pedal to on the BMXs. And, um, you know, that's why my bike is so good or like, you know, the old school bikes, you can just put your seat up and pedal there and then you put your seat down at the pump track and pedal Yeah, there. just get, equip, get a, a, a five millimeter Allen key or a quick release seat clamp and it's happy days. Yeah. Um, and then, but, but like, you know, mountain bike is brilliant here and e-bikes, there's more, I've seen more and more e-bikes all the time. So, you know, I've lived here just under three years, two and a half years now. And the amount of e-bikes that come at weekend at the weekend is probably like three, four times more now. So it's great for that. But my lad doesn't want to pedal 300 meters up to the top of the hill, you know, to ride down. Whereas if there was a, a dirt BMX track here, I'm sure like, all the kids would be on it every day, you know. Yeah, I suppose it's we're overthinking it, aren't we? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, in in the not too distant future, we'll we'll you know that people will um, the penny will drop in terms of you know a, a simpler form of BMX racing that doesn't need. You turn up there with a, a tiger power block, you're going to be on your ass. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We better get, yeah, they better hurry up getting, making those comp threes again. Yeah, yeah. Haven't they? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, and maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I still think that, you know, modern BMX racing and a more, a more dirt orientated version of it could work hand in hand. Yeah, a little bit like, definitely. Supercross yeah. and motocross work, so you can be a specialist in one, yeah. but you can still do both. Uh, and I don't think we would get that many older riders, to be honest, because we're all getting like knackered, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> but but you know the younger kids and maybe the dirt that you know the, the the younger riders that ride dirt would be into this as well. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So it, it'd be before I'm done with this, I'd like to see that happen. You know. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, me too. Um, and like, yeah, like you said, we've, we've talked about it a few times. It'd be really cool to, uh, at some point, get get an event, uh, happening. Just yeah, see how it goes. Um, and you know that might in increase the uh the the resurgence of all these cool bikes that you're starting to bring in, like the talkers and stuff. You know, um, well, you uh, know, but. but Maybe, but like I say, I, I I think we'd be surprised how many of the younger kids who'd be, yeah, who'd but, be who'd be who'd be down for this. But when I, you know, if I pedal around the the our village, uh, on my like six grand e bike, or I go out on my old school um cruiser with my skyways on, I get way more looks off the kids shouting, "Wow, that's a cool bike." You know, it's, it's I mean, it's hard for us to say because that's our era, but the bikes do look good. Yeah, you know, we've ever we've ever been to like an old event and there's been kids there. They've just been like, "Wow, look at that! That looks," and, yeah. and really, that's this you know part of the success of SE. Yeah, because Todd's taken those cues from you know SE's past and yeah. packaged it in like a twenty nine er or a twenty six or a twenty seven and a half. On a twenty-seven point five plus, yeah. I'll, I'll put a derailleur on it. I've done 
whatever he's done with it. And, you know, people are like, wow, that's amazing. And yeah. then he'll show a picture of like, yeah, this design's from like 1979. Yeah. It just goes to show how fundamentally right it was, you know, all, all you know, from all those, uh, from all those years ago. So, uh, yeah, sure. it'd be it'd be well, good. But yeah, I'll send you that link to the to the thing in France. It looks really cool. I'm gonna try to. Uh, if I've just had an email off the guy today, so hopefully, but it takes us ages to email because his English is pretty good, and I'm learning French. My French is quite bad, so I've I've got like a third of the way through the email, and then I've got like I've got to do some future tense, and I don't like googling it, you know. No, I just have to copy and paste Google Translate. Well, I don't like doing that. So I'll be like, if I have to say, you know, we will be coming and I've got to think of how to say that in French, I, I will learn how to be able to do it. And then I've Brilliant. And then, then, then I've got it. And our language is amazing. When I was in, um, it was funny when I was in hospital, we had a lot of nurses from um, from the southern part of India, from Kerala uh, yeah. specifically. So just out of respect because they're they're just so amazing um yeah. I, i'd start to learn Keralea. i'd start to learn phrases in um they speak uh, malayalam which is uh, a little bit like uh tamil and it's written like in sanskrit so i can't read it so i would learn but i would learn enough phrases um so it was quite funny so i remember going down to um radiology for uh, an end endoscopy don't even ask me what that shit is. But anyway, and then I, I, I could kind of, I, you get used to the accent, don't you, a little bit? Do you know what I mean? So I, I would say, I would say, Ningal Malayam San Samikumu, which yeah, means, right. you know, do you, do you speak Malayam? And they'd be like, yes. And I'd ask them where they were from. And then they would, you know, say, you know, you know, Kochi or wherever they were from, like in Kerala. Uh, uh, yeah, it was quite, it was funny because, and then I remember going down one time saying this to them and they're like, they've got all the other nurses in, so they had all the Carol, and I'm just this like middle-aged white guy and, and I can only say phrases, do you know what I mean? But yeah, it was really, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was funny. And, and I think that if you're somewhere and you're in a situation and you can just learn a little bit of the language, it's always respectful, isn't it? No. Uh, and especially for those who are who are who are caring for you, do you know what I mean? Uh, and um, yeah, so I spent, I, I stopped learning French really because I switched to um, I switched to Mal to learning Malayalam, and I'm not really on Facebook, but I, some you know we post to Instagram and then that post yeah, to Facebook. Yeah. Sometimes I'll post to Instagram and I'll make a mistake, and I've got to log into Facebook yeah. to be able to um, to fix a typo or something that I've done wrong. Do you know what I mean? So I logged into face. This is last week. This is just last week. I log into Facebook, and um, like, it isn't in English anymore. Yeah, I can't even explain this. So I I, I copied and pasted um, something that it like said, and um, put it into Google Translate. You know, and it, you can get detect language. It's like detect language, um, and it would translate it into English. So it like translated into English language Malayalam. No way. How's he done that? So I must have. It's like when you talk about something, the next minute on your Instagram, it comes you've got up. Got an ad for it. It's all listening to you. I would have thought that with Facebook, you've got to change user language. And then anyway, I logged out and logged back in again, and it's now in English. Right. Crazy. Oh, that's that's funny, isn't it? Um, yeah. What were we talking about now? <laughs> how are you going to do? Look, we've gone too far. We've gone, how are you going to even? Oh, my, my, uh, <laughs> oh, my area. My, my daughter's going to have to um, edit all this and decide what to do with it. <laughs> it's it's uneditable. It's just <laughs> garbage. It's just no. Don't worry about it. Um, so, well, I guess we. It's probably about midnight, so we probably should um, call it a day soon. But before before we do, it's it's been real really interesting to me. And I'm sure there's going to be loads of old school BMXs and it, 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 it's hard because so many things are are, are connected. So yeah. I, I really do have a difficulty, even if I'm talking to somebody and we're talking about something. Is 
it like something's related to something else. Yeah, and, you no. just go, and you don't want to like not mention that. I know. Because it's relevant. relevant. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like, oh, tell me about the riders, you know, Tony Holland or whatever from then. Because the, there's other things that like, you know, music and your story, yeah. Yeah. You know, cr cross over. And um, I even even talked about like, you know, the motorbike thing and the stuff that we've done in recent years and I know we haven't talked about any all of my that. all my arrests and the all my, the reason why I can't get a visa to go to America. <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't talked about. I think we're we're gonna have to do another one at another another point, like which I'm sure is going to happen with a lot of people, especially pe when when you're when you're in your fifties like us. We've got a lot to to say, haven't we? Because <laughs> we've been around for a while. Oh, I mean, I had to learn like legal stuff and. You know, I've self -present represented myself at the Royal Court of Justice and yeah, like mad stuff that you never thought. I had to buy a suit. Yeah. I was 57 before I had to buy my first suit. I thought I'd done pretty well there, you know. You did. I got, I got, I got the best that British Heart Foundation could offer. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk about that another time, but um, just. You know, briefly, what's what's after? I've you know I've been following your Instagram for ages, and 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 it's been really exciting watching these talkers getting made. And you've just you've just uh, had them delivered this week, haven't you? Is that correct? Yeah, a uh, bit of a yeah, uh, and you know, product is great in the end, and uh, yeah, I mean, Bill Ryan is the custodian of the brand who has done Supercross BMX. Um, and, and I've always had a lot of respect for for Bill. Uh, you know, we have done the brand in the past, and when Hilly rode for us, he was on Supercross. Yeah, I remember. Um, but but Bill's like worse than me, man. He's got so many things going on. Right. He's just like a madman. Um, and you know whether and I know he's got like you know he's Sunder and Angela and some great people around him, but like, yeah, Bill's pretty bad at taking a lot of stuff on. <laughs> Sure. Um, and, and who else would like go oh yeah let's do talker how many frames should we do to start with does nine sound about right no but you know the guy is a genius and you know he's managed to be able to pull it off so I'm like yeah let's just do <laughs> you know one and like nah I, I, let's do nine and I'm like oh how far are you on with these he goes oh they're in production no way and I'm just like, so yeah, it is really exciting, and it's been very humbling to see uh, um, how how important talk as a brand, you know, was, and not just because of like the USP of the twin top tube. People just really, 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 really love the brand. Yeah. And let's be honest, it's one of the great, you know, iconic brands of BMX's golden era that hasn't been done yeah. to death. Yeah. So it, it it's amazing to be, you know, involved with that, you know, or all over again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's stoked. I I just saw Cal Sanderson's bike built up. Did you see that? I saw a picture of it, yeah. 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 So uh yeah. cool. So I think they've done a great job with that because it's still it's got all the modern geometry, but it's got a taller standover. Yeah. Um and um and which one know, was is well, that, that's the that's like the Pro X twenty four. That's the Pro X twenty four. Yeah. So yeah. So we've got Pro X twenty, XL and double XL, and then 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 the uh, and then the twenty four and the twenty four sold out here and in America. I mean, I think we sold all the frames, bar maybe four within the first five minutes when they went live, because Bill didn't want us to pre sell them because he was doing the launch at Dirty Fest. And it would have caused problems because people in America would have been ordering frames for us to ship back there. And yeah. it would all have been a mess. Uh, and and I, I wasn't sure how it was going to work. And then we ended up aligning our launch time to the same as them. So we had a countdown on the website. Yeah, so it was 5 p.m., you know, uh, GMT, which was 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we were all 
um and, and you know it, it it's 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 all gone it's all gone it's all gone really well uh so far but we're still <laughs> we're still sticker in the frames and then you know we've got some bills to be able to do for customers um we've got a couple of really high really nice high-end bills to do for uh for people so i can't i mean you're probably the same as me a frame yeah but when you see it as a bike oh yeah it's a whole other thing, isn't it? So I can't wait to see, you know, Carl's bike. But <clears throat> if you go on to the Talker Riders uh, group on Facebook, that's basically where people are putting all the pictures okay. of the bill. So that's really, really exciting uh, to do that. And then there's going to be another. These aren't limited edition. We're just going to keep making them. Then there's going to be another batch of frames, um, you know, this year, uh, and then um, and then next year is uh, Tarka's 50 year anniversary so yes. there'll probably be some cool stuff wow but then i i imagine and um you know i don't know where this is going to go on yeah. the modern side but you know maybe you know there will be more um more race orientated you know modern whether there'll be a carbon talk I, that's up. That's that. That's up to Bill. But um, yeah, it, I mean, just doing Supercross, and then he's got retro Supercross frames coming out because Supercross is thirty-five years. Wow. Yeah. Old. So he's got collaborations. You know, I know they've got a. Uh, there's going to be a Vans collaboration Supercross shoe. Nice. And, you know, on other really cool. So how he can do all that and do. Got to be a black. A black, white, and yellow talker van shoe come out there. Well, are you listening, Vans? Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, like black, black with the with the golden yellow and then the black and. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So he's already got that contact there. So who knows where that's going to go? And um, yeah, it's it's really uh, it's really it's really exciting. It and it's and it's it's tough, you know. Bill's got flack because he didn't have frames with the American bottom bracket mm -hmm. because the freestyle frames he did mid, the race frames he did Euro, and even the vintage frames that he did, like the um, the Eddie King, like the Eddie King was basically like a 280, 280X or the LP, LPX in, in frame um, terminology. But the Eddie King frame always had a Euro BB. Because he wasn't going to, you know, he only had an American bottom bracket, so you could put a one-piece crank through it, right? Yeah. So people were like, oh, what's this new threaded thing? And like, no, this is 1979. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'd much rather put a European bottom bracket into a frame than knock some cups in with a piece of wood and a hammer. Same. But, but I think people that were, you know, don't really remember that, Perhaps, you know, just grew up on American bottom brackets. That's the thing that they remember. But even the Robinson, the Scott Clark frame had a European, the, the frame that Tony Holland rode, the Scott Clark frame, that was a Euro BB. Wow. Um, and obviously this was designed for like a Shimano or Campag square taper. Yeah. Bottom bracket, but obviously you, you can run a, a, a flight crank in there now yeah. with a 19 millimeter spindle or even a 22 millimeter spindle from a gt crank and we've got bottom brackets that fit into those fit in so there. but bill did get you know quite a bit of stick from people saying you know why is it even though we did all those different things trying to cover every all bases you're not going to be able to please everybody and, and everything that i've seen you know in terms of the graphics and you know how well everything's been done it couldn't be in a better place so yeah. uh, I'm, I'm i'm stoked with that and where it can go you know, is there going to be a you know a, a, a talker at the at the worlds a carbon? Why not? Yeah. I say. Yeah, where's the, where's the world um, next year? Well, I don't know. It's in America this year, isn't it? In Rocky Hill. I don't know where it is. Are you? You're not thinking what? I, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I I'm, it's not I'd in only, Scotland. I'd only be interested in the uh, in a in a Crow Molly one though. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
you know, John's how many nationals has John Bentley won on the SM Steel Panther, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, Quite uh, a few. Yeah. If I could make a final on a STR1 with the bottom bracket flexing in half, then um, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Tuck Pro X would be better. I mean, these these have, you know, when they have the samples, these have been tested on the, you know, these are, I mean, and then the other thing that we have in our, um, um, we have available to us is we've got that, the Talker Targa frame, which was going to be the new Talker frame before Talker went bust, and it's the frame that Mark Cox and and Darren Reedy rode. Reedy rode it in '86 at Slough. Yeah. So basically, uh, they don't have the gusset uh, around the seat tube. Yeah. So the two tubes run parallel, and then yeah. they just weld it around the seat tube. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Maybe a frame like that with a dismount. Yeah, that low profile could be could be a cool thing. So it's still a top twin top tube. Yeah. They didn't have, they didn't have a gusset at all on the on the head tube. They didn't even have the little red line gusset from the Pro X. Did your Pro X gusset crack? Well, no, but I I I ended up when I stopped when I stopped doing the BMX again and got into like doing mountain biking full time. Uh, I, a young lad who used to take racing ended up with my Talker Pro X, and I think he snapped it. Oh, yeah. We never had one snap, but all the gussets cracked uh, yeah. at the weld at the at the you know the little triangular red line style gusset. Yeah. Uh, at, at the front of the gusset where it welds to the head tube, they just used to have a hairline crack. Right. You know, I even my the one I've got from eighty, I've got my bike from eighty six. Um and you know that's cracked and you know yeah. and, and I wasn't a big jumper or anything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no. I mean I was, yeah, I wasn't too hard on bikes because I you know I did, I did jumps and stuff, but I always did like kind of tried to jump smooth, not you know, mm. big stunts and stuff. Do you yeah, know? yeah. But instead of like up, yeah. Yeah. So um, but yeah, he, I, I'll have to ask him again because I actually saw him um. Last month when I went to California, he's done really well in the in the in his um j job in his field. Uh, um, it's like a graphic design for for Apple and TV companies wow. and you know digital di digital adverts and stuff. And he he, he lives in um, Santa Monica at the moment. Um, and I, I did mention about the, uh, telling him that the Talker Pro X's were coming back out and you were doing them. And he was like, oh, yeah, that one I got off you. I, I snapped it or something, but I never got into it. So I need to ask him again and see what happened to it. Yeah, still, we, if he's still got it in the garage, we can weld it up, right? <laughs> I know. I don't, I don't think he has. I think uh, he's got a few things in, the, in his garage. He's, uh, he's done really well in, in, in his, uh, you know, in in his life with 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 what he does. Um, oh, don't you hate these people? <laughs> <laughs> I used to pick him up and take him racing every week in my Astro van. Oh, these successful people—they make you sick. <laughs> no, I was I was I was made up for him. It was it's oh. really cool. So um, anyway, um, well, it, it, it sounds like a perfect candidate for uh, one of these Pro X's all tricked out I've, with the I've profile vintage cranks on and everything. Al. I'll I'll speak to him and I'll 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 build I'll I'll build him an invoice and we'll send it to him. All right, yeah. And don't don't sell them all. Don't forget, I've got to get one of these things. We've got them. Don't worry. You're 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 yeah. I've I've allocated them over for you when they came in. So we're all we're all uh, we're all good. We've just got to get a um my uh, uh my niece Melanie, my sister's daughter. Um, road for is in 81 on talker um, and melanie um gilmore now wallhead uh lynn's found her original shirt wow and she just sent me pictures of it this is the original 1981 shirt i'll send you a photograph of it it's yeah. absolutely mint you know they were white and they used yeah. to go yellow yeah it's absolutely like perfect oh, so wow. it'd be you know i'll have to speak to bill about us doing some uh, do, doing a few shirts. Uh, I've got the fonts and all that stuff to be able to do them. So, and, and they were on like a uh, 
they were printed on like a PK material, like a polo shirt. Yeah. So we'd need to find a long sleeve because obviously it's easy to go to like RSD and say make us, you know, a couple yeah, of fish. shirts, like team shirts. But it'd be cool to have original, yeah, the original shirt. Sense. And we've got a hate transfer. In fact, we still had up until recently the original heat transfers no way. that I bought from Talker in February 1985. I don't know if they'd still work. I made a couple of shirts, made one for Craig Burroughs for the, the race that we did at Warrington. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it'd still work, but at least it'd be good to be able to get the yeah. exact measurements and everything off. But I've got Melanie's shirt now that we could do that from. And it's got the Yohar of California and the Amy and the Haro okay. and the Max, all, all, wow. all of it. And, and it's all done using heat transfer. So we've got, you know, I've got a, um, a vinyl cutter and, um, you know, a heat, heat press and all that. So we could we can make those, you know, yeah. we can make those shirts. But obviously I need to speak to Bill first to be able to get that approval yeah, yeah. to be able to, uh, to. But, yeah, we could do it. And it, they had UK team. Yeah, we could replicate all that, and then the names on the back, as I did the, you know, the sample one with you and John. Yeah, yeah. We can do hopefully, you know, if that uh, passes um, approval, you know, we'll be able to do, you know, a, a couple of those just for like team riders. Uh, yeah. it's quite, uh, quite cool. John's John's all set for. Um, John's you know definitely racing is at Cumbernauld. So. Um, so yeah, because that's the I've not rode the track. I've, because that's well, that's the closest track to me, but it's quite a long way away. But uh, everyone loves that track. We, we did a thing with the our riders at the uh, like favorite track, and it, it, everyone's like Cumbernal. And then the one after that is Platt Fields in Manchester. Okay, well, I'm I'm gonna look at the dates and see if I can get to Cumbernal before that. Ride the track, and maybe I'll do it. Well, have you got enough parts to build a, a modern bike up from yeah. twenty inch to twenty four? Yeah, but I've got two. I've got two one-off new-proof BMX bikes. I'll just swap all the parts over. Yeah, yeah. And if you need a couple of bits, we can we can we can sort that. Uh... Yeah, just wait. I know you're busy, so when you've got time, let me know, and I'll bob. Because down you, you could run um, on the Pro X, the twenty or the twenty-four. You can run like modern external, like a Holotech two type BB. Well, uh, mine's got um, a Euro bottom bracket with red line flights in it. Well, whichever. Yeah. I mean that thought. that would go that would go straight. You know, providing the the spacing's okay for the for the back. But I, I'm not sure. I think Cal probably built his up with external bearings. You could do either. Okay. Well, we uh, obviously, I just like the external bearings because you've got the the longevity, haven't you? Like the the small Euro bearings. They don't last as long, do they? Do you know what I mean? But anyway, there's a there's, there's an let let's try and work on that anyway. Yeah, uh, I don't know why we put all this in the video. God, no, we're just getting excited about talkers now. <laughs> uh, but um, so anyway, um, yeah, I think we'll have to. Uh, there's too much good stuff to talk about, so we'll we'll get another one in down the line um, if the podcast is going well. And um, yeah, this will be the kiss of death. There'll never be another one. You'll put this out, and people will be like, <laughs> "Have you seen that Nige Page podcast?" It's fucking bullshit. <laughs> It just goes on and on and on and on and on. I'm, I yeah, I'm not watching it again. But it's listen, if somebody, so had a, if somebody was going on a flight to California and they wanted to go to sleep, <laughs> perfect. That's it. You'd be, you'd be mid, mid-Atlantic mid Ocean. You just, you just, you'd have just gone past Iceland and you'd be like... I have to wake, wake them up when we get there. Oh, God. If they arrive in LAX, they'd be like, straight to like Google... Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, and thank you to Maya for. I don't. Yeah. Uh, best, we, best, we, best of luck. Best of thanks, luck. Thanks, Alan. Them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't have a clue what to do if it wasn't for Maya. <laughs> awesome. So we'll speak. I'll speak to you off camera, offline, and we'll we'll get these bikes sorted. We'll get the talkers sorted. Yeah, we'll put no the world to rights. But um. Hey, th thanks so much for today. It's been a uh, obviously I I um you know I've known you a long time and uh when I was a kid your your team and your shop and you and everything was like unbelievable for me. So um you know it made my my childhood amazing. So uh, well, let's do it all again. Yeah.
But th thanks very much for your time today. I'm really glad that you you're feeling better and you've got over the worst of that. Um, that that was uh not nice to hear when I heard about that and. I'm stoked, stoked you're doing well, and um, just massive congrats on everything you've done, Alan, for uh, for BMX and yourself and the shop, and it's in it's incredible. There needs to be more people like you, Alan. Mm -hmm. So th thanks very much for your time, and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I think this has been an incredible episode. Um, I've loved doing it and chatting with Alan. Um, if you like the episode and the podcast, please remember to like, subscribe and do all that stuff. Um, you can listen to the podcast on various channels if you look on the links on my Instagram and we're on YouTube as well. Where you can see mine and Alan's young, beautiful faces. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much and we'll see you next time.